Exodus 35 verses 10 through 19 in the Christian Standard Bible read, Let all the skilled artisans among you come and make everything that the Lord has commanded, the tabernacle, its tent and covering, its clasps and supports, its crossbars, its pillars and bases, the ark with its poles, the mercy seat, and the curtain for the screen, the table with its poles, all its utensils, and the bread of the presence, the lampstand for light with its utensils, and lamps as well as the oil for the light, the altar of incense with its poles, the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense, the entryway screen for the entrance to the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with its bronze grate, its poles, and all its utensils, the basin with its stand, the hangings of the courtyard, its posts and bases, and the screen for the gate of the courtyard, the tent pegs for the tabernacle, and the tent pegs for the courtyard, along with their ropes, and specifically woven garments for ministering in the sanctuary, the holy garments for the priest Aaron, and the garments for his sons to serve as priests. Here, Moses is having the children of Israel prepare the tabernacle in the way God commanded. Uh, we see everyone working together for the crafts, tailoring robes, and decorating the worship area. Even though we are no longer under the laws of Moses as Christians, we believe aesthetics can play an important part of worship still. Elizabeth. Elizabeth Clyde. Pang. Uh, why do you believe God had the people of Israel put so much into the decor of their worship area? And what can the church today learn from that? Yeah, I think... One of the main reasons is just to show that this area, this worship area, is going to be set apart. When you enter it, you are supposed to like give reverence to it. I was just telling Taylor the other day or the other week when I went to Catholic Mass with my grandmother and we walked into the tabernacle and we had the stained glass. We had the... Um, like all the, the brass uh, adornments and whatnot, it just felt different versus walking into an auditorium of a modern church. So it just, it had still the reverence feeling when I went to Mass with my grandmother, which, I mean, atmosphere plays a big role in worship. Yes, you can worship anywhere and everywhere, but the posture and the location can help as well. Hmm. Oh, man. I don't think I could possibly say that better. Hey guys, you know what time it is. We're back with possibly your favorite church unity podcast, The Whole Church Podcast. I'm Joshua Knoll. No one cares about that. What I, what you do care about. Uh, we have two fantastic guests today um, who, who do their own podcast, The Clydes, who's also part of the Anazal Ministry Podcast Network. We have Pangalingan, Elizabeth T and Taylor Clyde. <laughs> there we go. Lots of names for me to say. Um, I only say Pangolingan because I'm inevitably going to say Pang because that was her nickname when we went to camp together. And uh, I can't help it. So you guys need a reference to know why I'm saying that. Taylor, I, I think I also met at camp as a separate event. And uh, we're all grown to be friends through Killer Bunnies and other things. Um, good times. We invited them to be the first guest of our ecumenical aesthetic series for several reasons. Um, Elizabeth actually is a teacher of the culinary arts. Also, she has participated in what's known as worship painting. We're going to talk about today. Taylor, who is now a media pastor. I believe media is the right term. If not, okay, cool. I got it right. And uh, also, he used to be a worship pastor, and he just likes art. So it just made sense for him to be here. So uh, welcome to the show, guys. Glad to be here. Oh, yeah. yeah. And of course, yeah. they're glad. Of course, they're glad when we're here with with the phenomena, like, you know, a lot of people are talking about one piece these days, maybe the Florida state Seminoles crushing LSU. I don't know. There's lots of things that people are amazed by in today's Clinton and world. Duke. But one thing that never fails to amaze the, the legions of people out there is the wonder that is the most talented co-host to ever co-host a podcast. TJ Tiberius Juan Blackwell. Welcome to your show. Thanks. So, yeah. Uh, if you like what we're doing here for some reason, uh, check out the other Annals Ale Ministries podcasts, uh, network, you know, we are here with two technical guests, but we're kind of co-hosts sort of, we're, you know, co-network, you know, some, some slight, uh, chat with us on our discord server in the notes. Uh, we love to answer questions and by answer questions, we mean, ask that question you ask to someone else to get the right answer and relay that back to you. So. 
take full advantage of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, also, Elizabeth is one of the co-hosts of Systematic Geekology that uh, TJ and I are both on. And, uh, you know, I say co-host, but I've, I've been noticing. It's funny because, like, the recording schedule and the airing schedule is a little bit different. Usually the recording schedule is a little bit more fair, a little bit more spaced out. If you've been following SG, the last, like, five episodes in a row or something are all Elizabeth. I'm like, ah, oh, she's nailing it out there. <laughs> anyway, you guys may or may not know that I have a favorite form of church unity that we get to talk about on this show. And uh, it's it's been scientifically proven that you cannot have disunion while being silly. So my favorite form of unity is silliness. And we will do participate in that spiritual practice today with a silly question. Today's is, which scripture do you think would make for the worst Van Gogh painting? TJ and I will go first. Give you time to think about it. Uh, TJ. So... Uh, I think this is, it kind of depends on the version you're reading because <laughs> I, I, you know, I read the CSB, the Christian standard Bible, and it doesn't read like this. Uh, but if you're reading the American standard version of the Bible, uh, Psalms 38, five says, uh, my loins are filled with burning and there is no soundness in my flesh. Uh, <laughs> I think wow. that would not be a good Van Gogh painting. Um, Man, you know, I'm tempted to say, what, what's that psalm that says, blessed are those who dash the babies against the rocks? Like, that that has to be bad. But, you know, it, it can make for, like, a dark, twisted kind of, like, I'm sure someone out there would like that. So instead, I'm going to go with the, like, the genealogy at the beginning of the book of Matthew. Because there's no way he could make that good. <laughs> um, Taylor, what do you think? What's the, the worst Van Gogh painting for a verse? A verse? So, yeah, you know what, I mean. <laughs> what is the, uh... What's the lady who like takes the tent peg and derives it into the de- man tent peg lady has always been close to my heart. Just, she just bah, right, right there. I, I would, I would almost not want to see that on a Van Gogh painting. You know, it could that. be cool with That's the swirls, fair. you know, red <laughs> swirls over here. Yeah. I don't know. That, that <laughs> definitely be interesting. All right. Elizabeth. So the first thing that came to mind, but it sounded more like a true crime than a Van Gogh painting, was when they pretty much raped the person to death, the woman, oh. and they cut up her body and sent each piece to um, each tribe of Israel. Like, I would not enjoy that painting. Ooh, yeah, no, that that's bad. That's also judges. <laughs> yeah. But then also Leviticus twenty fifteen: if a man's lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to oh, death. Oh, yeah, that, that one's... And a, you shall also kill be... the animal. Like, that's like that's just the absolutely not. Like, like what, you don't want to see poor that. animal. <laughs> that would be a yeah, pretty the, bad Van Gogh the painting. The animal didn't have a choice in this. So, like, you have animal cur- cruelty. It's just not okay. That's, yeah, that's just bad. That mm-hmm. Yeah. I, she might have won. I yeah. think she wins. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, one of the main reasons we're doing this series, and not the silly question, uh, is because of our belief that beauty can bring people closer to God and to one another. So we have a few questions we're asking everyone in the series to go along with that belief. So I hope you guys are ready. But uh, if you're not, you have until I finish this sentence. So uh, could you tell us of a time where you've seen God in the beauty of creation outside? Not human creation. That is kind of cheating. Uh, And whoever wants to go first can go first. Like outside as in nature? Yeah. Hmm. What about you, Clyde? Yeah, I'll give you some time to think on it. Um, for me, I almost always, I don't know. Have you guys read that book, The Sacred Pathways? I've heard of it. So I don't know exactly who it's by, um, but it's, it's another Foster, one of I think. Richard Foster, maybe. Um, but it's one of those sort of that it's kind of like a personality test. Only this one asks you a series of questions and it kind of not to shift the conversation too much, but it kind of lets you know how you best connect with God. And one of those ways is the naturalist. And that's a person who experiences God most and most strongly through nature and stuff. And so I don't know if that's me. I haven't taken that test yet. Um, I need to, but every time I am out on the water in my kayak, or if I'm just looking at an open body of water, it is like the most spiritual experience for me. For some reason, there's just something about 
whether it's calm water and that is encouraging, or if it's just washy waves hitting up against the battery over in Charleston, like that to me, the Lord speaks through that as well. So I think it's really just anytime I experience water, that's when I really see the beauty of God and and really his character too, most often. Yeah. yeah. I strongly mine, relate to that. Mine's also not really water, but one of the most, I guess, memories that came to mind was it was right after like a tragedy just happened in my life and I we just happened to have like a beach trip with work planned and so I just woke up super early in the morning completely pitch back black dark and I grabbed my journal and I just sat on the beach and I waited for the sun to rise because I was so hopeless and I was like yeah. I just need the sun to rise like and it just showed it was a new day and like God is going to redeem the day so I feel like sunrise is a super like spiritual for me because even as long as that sun is rising, you have like purpose in your life. Man, you got to be careful. We have three and a half Pentecostals on right now, so we might just start speaking in tongues. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So another question we're asking everybody, um, just see if you could share a moment with us, if you have one, that you felt a special connection to a painting or sculpture or anything like that. Elizabeth has one. Claude Monet, Water Lilies Paintings. When we went to MoMA, which is the modern um, museum of art in New York City, like this painting took up three quarters of the wall. And it was like you felt like you were immersed into that painting. And it was like it was so cool because it was one of those things where I learned about this in a textbook and I got to experience in real life. So it just felt really surreal. That does sound nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Good luck following that, Taylor. (laughs) Yeah, good. Um, Technically, he was there, too. Yeah, Yeah, funny story. We walked all through that museum and we're about to leave. And Liz is so upset because she goes, I'm pretty sure they had a whole Monet exhibit. We missed it. So we had to backtrack through the whole thing. And we eventually found it, thank God, (laughs) because it was an entire room full of multiple Monet paintings. Um, That is cool. Mine is, uh, sculptures are cool. Mine is also related to painting. Um, I haven't had many um, moments, you know, spiritually marking with, with sculptures. Um, but the other day I had a crazy week at work. And so over the weekend, I enjoy spending time alone. That's kind of how I refresh and refill. So drove downtown, um, about 30 minutes to the Gibbs Museum of Art. In and Charleston. I had never been. Yeah. And really cool stuff. I mean, I just, they had several floors, I think three or four different floors of art pieces. Um, everything from super old furniture to a couple of sculptures, mostly paintings, Um, But one of the exhibits, I can't remember the artist's name, um, but one of the exhibits was of, it was a black artist and she did a self-portrait of her, but it was almost as if she was like a silhouette. And on the inside Mm. of all of it, they were just blooming flowers. And growing up, um, flowers kind of has a special place in my life because growing up, my mom would always tell me to bloom where I'm planted. And that was kind of her default response, right, to um, (laughs) difficult situations, whatever else is happening. So that kind of always has a special thing. And I I remember when I first saw this piece in that museum, I just kind of stood there and I just I just kind of waited. And I wasn't like waiting for the Lord to speak or I wasn't like looking for something to jump out or or anything like that. I just kind of sat in that for a moment. And it was it was really I don't know. To me, it was, it, it reminded me that people are so much more than what we see on the surface. Mm-hmm. Uh, at one point we can look at a person, it's not in a painting. We can look at a human being and we can assume something, we can see something. But then as illustrated by the painting, it was a totally different thing happening. There's all these beautiful colors and textures of this flower that I hadn't you know, seen on the outside, but they were there. So it was, that was a really cool experience. Um, regarding that specific painting over at the Gibbs Museum. Man, that actually reminds me of a story that very conveniently is going to segue to the next question. <laughs> and uh, and also, Elizabeth will relate to half of this story. <laughs> so when I was young, my mother and I, we really liked going to the Cherry Blossom Festival in D.C. Oh, and, wow. You know, cherry blossoms are just always beautiful. Um, And then when I was in college to like solidify my love for cherry blossoms, I watched the anime one piece. Everybody's really into that right now because of the live action 
There's an arc that's not in the live action yet. That's Drum Island. We're going to be talking about it soon on Systematic Ecology. So for, you know, just quick plug, everybody check that out. But the in the arc, there is Chopper. This The medical person for the ship eventually has this belief that was passed down to him that beauty can heal. And part of that beauty was to recreate this image of a giant cherry blossom tree. When I got in my accident, whenever, you know, I had a lot of scars from the car accident, I actually got a cherry blossom tree tattooed on my arm to cover up some of the scars because cherry blossoms represent new life. There's that healing and art thing. And there's the connection with my mom, right? Um, say Elizabeth can relate because she got the cherry blossom tattoo from one piece. So, you know, it was like halfway related. <laughs> um, but that that belief that healing comes from art isn't just in anime. I actually sent TJ the study last week, I think. But there's studies that prove that there is healing in beauty whenever we perceive beauty. Why do you guys think, and I'll let Taylor answer this one first. Why do you believe that God would have wired us this way, that beauty can heal? Yeah. I think first and foremost, it is just the character of God to put the most powerful things in the most simple packages, probably to irritate us and how often I'm looking at one, two, three, four, five different little degrees on my wall right now in the <laughs> office. And it's yeah. probably to make people like me who have spent a lot of time in textbooks uh, frustrated because we can miss the simple stuff a lot of times. Um, but I, I, I think it's, it's probably just from my perspective, I can see that it, in, in my experience, it has just kept me grounded and rooted and outside of the heady world of all of the books, you know, that we read and all the knowledge we try to consume. It's, it's like when we get back to the basics and the simple things of just seeing beauty in, in nature, specifically in my experience, we just really find those simple truths of God and they're, they're powerful truths as well. It kind of reminds me, have you ever heard of forest bathing? No. Maybe a little interest. Okay. Yeah. 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 Like, so I feel um, like I've seen people t post about it, but not like yes. the definition. So, from what I understand, forest bathing is this Japanese practice of essentially, and it, it interestingly enough, it's medically prescribed in a lot of different nations. So, doctors in some of these nations will prescribe you to essentially go walk in nature and go walk in the forest because. You just, you observe nature, you deep, you breathe deeply, you get fresh air in and it, it boosts your, your health, your mental health and gets you clarity, all that kind of fun stuff. And it's interesting that they've got data to back up oh. how, how much health can actually be found in that simple act of just spending time outside, you know, away yeah. from the, away from the desk, uh, the home, the office, the traffic, all those stresses, you just go into nature and these doctors are prescribing not pills but trees and nature and all this crazy stuff so i think it's it's probably for me most of the time it's just been that god has been trying to keep me rooted and simplified a lot i complicate a lot of things man <laughs> and don't we all yeah it's crazy you can live in a country where you can get prescribed to go touch grass it's wild <laughs> go outside yeah. such an interesting That'll be three thousand dollars please that. thank you so much <laughs> Yeah. Well, so Elizabeth, did you uh you have anything you wanted to add on to like why you think maybe God built us this way? Yeah, I just think of like the scripture in Psalms, like if he clothes the lily, how much more will he clothes you? And so yeah. I just think about also the scripture, like if we don't cry out and worship him, the rocks are gonna cry out. And so it's just it all points back to God, even not just us being created, but also everything he created, the plants, the rocks, the wildlife all points back to God. And it, like, as Taylor was saying, it does heal us and it makes us slow down and appreciate and to see God's beauty because us as humans, we sin, we're flawed. People suck a lot. They do. But guess who doesn't talk back to me? Flowers. I was going to say Taylor. <laughs> that too, Taylor. But so I just, I think about, Taylor as Taylor was saying, the best flower. But it it just calms you down. Like it's it gives you time to be alone with your thoughts and just to like see like you can see God in everything. I always say often you find what you're looking for. So if you go out into a forest or on the beach and you see like you go search for God, he's going to meet you 
and show himself in any way. Hmm. All right. So before we get to the more unique aspects of this episode, uh, there is another segment we're going to be doing in each one uh, for the ecumenical aesthetic series called the artist's corner. Uh, So we have a few questions here. Uh, We're going to do as many as we can in seven minutes. Oh, boy. So we could do them all. But seven minutes from now, we're done wherever we end up. Okay. So how do, does your church have stained glass? And if so, what's on it? No, we do not have stained glass. Next yeah. question, please. I kind of figured that because, you know, Pentecostal. But uh, so how do you use music or other art in your worship time? Taylor, you go. Uh, like a lot of other churches, we use um we use contemporary music, which I think may be a question, hopefully not. Um, but we use music in our um, beginning portion of service to kind of give everybody a chance to sing, get on the same page, you know, cool down from just yelling at your kids getting out of the car um, before we open up our hearts to the message. Um, we play, uh, what was the first part of the question again? Uh, the, how to use music or other art in your worship time. Okay, fair. And just in the worship time. So yes, uh, we have a full band that plays during the worship time where we lead people to corporately sing songs together. Elizabeth, do you got? Um, you we go add? to the same church, so same yeah. piece. Yeah, you know. Uh, so does your church have a flag? And if so, what do you know about it? I mean, the Assemblies of God does have a flag, but we don't display it at our church. Is that all you know about it, that you don't display it? Correct. Okay. Okay. So if your favorite Bible ver- verse passage were a painting, what would it look like? It's going to have to be Romans 5, 8 for me, um, where it, Paul talks about God demonstrating his love for us. And so it's probably going to be some kind of cross. Um but not necessarily. God demonstrated, yes, he demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. So I think it would be a a blend, right? You would see in one corner the cross marking the sacrifice of Christ, but in like another corner, you'd have it blending into an illustration of like a, a carnal lifestyle, right? You got, you know, debauchery. I just wanted to say that word. Uh, you got people drinking like crazy, um, you know, crazy other other things that you portray as uh, a debaucherous lifestyle. Again, wanted to say that word in a different form that time. <laughs> um, but yeah, probably that. Would it be just the cross or like a crucifix? It would have to be, he would have to be on the cross, I believe. Okay. That's okay. the demonstration. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. Yeah. What about you, Elizabeth? Hmm. All I can think of, like, I think of favorite paintings, which has been Starry Night by Van Gogh. And so I'm trying to think of, like, there's so many paint, there's so much scripture about, like, lights and heavens and stars. So I'm trying to have, like, trouble picking one. So the first one that I found when I did a quick Google search, uh, praise him, sun and moon, praise him, all stars of light, praise him, hev- highest heavens. So Starry Night. Boom. Okay. Uh, we're going to say that's cheating, but that's cool. So that's what is the most unique piece of art <laughs> that you've ever seen or heard? Hmm. I have to cheat on this one, Liz, because I was just talking about the Gibbs Museum, so it's fresh in my mind. There was this uh, piece that was, I don't know if it's classified as mixed mode or not, but there were all of these different um, shapes, and it was about five foot tall by probably 10 foot wide. And in some of the shapes, you could see black, but in some of them, there were screens. And you know, when you go to an art museum and you're looking at the exhibits, you kind of do like, you kind of do this number where you get kind of close to the stuff and you like look back and sometimes your face is, you're smiling. Sometimes you look serious. Well, in some of the shapes were screens and in, on some of the screens, you saw somebody else doing the exact same thing. So it felt like you were in the exhibit being watched by people and it was bizarre but i loved it that yeah, that's wild i'm gonna go with the um modern museum we went to in tokyo called team labs and so it was this pretty much immersive piece of art where it was in a dome shape and they just had all these flowers 
um, around you where it encompassed you 360. And so you would actually have to lay down to get the full experience and it immersed you. And it was like to the point like you felt like your body was moving and it made me nauseous. But that would probably be the most unique piece of art we went to. That's awesome. Hmm. That's really yeah. cool. Uh, so does your church have any statues that we could discuss? Nope, just a big old cross on the top. We have uh, Stephen Furtick shirtless riding a uh, unicorn that is kind of up on this mountain. No. Yeah, oh yeah, no. Yeah, I've seen that one. That's why we asked. Oh, it's a trap. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so do you prefer hymns or modern worship music? I think this is seven minutes. Um, I like hymns a lot. I just love I the I do like the hymns old, as well, yeah. It's so good. Okay, hmm. that's not what I was expecting. I know. Hmm. Healthy I'll respect fly for away, both. oh glory. I'll fly hmm. away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Banger. With Always that. eternal banger. Right. Uh, with that, we still haven't asked all of the questions, so they'll have to come back another episode. Another episode if they want to hear some of the other questions in the artist corner. Because we don't do them in order. You never know which ones he's going to ask, which ones he's going to skip. Uh, Kino is going to be on one of these. We might just get to one of them that episode. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> we only <laughs> missed one for the record. Yeah. Yeah, that was close. That's because they cheated, though. They both go to the same church. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, that's fair. That's fair. I mean, we're husband and wife. It yeah. would be bad if we did not go to the yeah, same I mean, church. Ooh, that's a conversation, bad. though. There's, there, is, there is a couple at the church I attend that go to different churches, because one of them's Catholic, How and the other work? one's like, I can't quite go that far. But he did. Ironically, he started off, I think it was Baptist, and he converted to Lutheranism after he got married, because he was like, this is as close as I can get to being Catholic. Hmm. I was like, hey, you right. know, that's fair, I guess. <laughs> well, I didn't meet you halfway. Just yeah, the closest thing <laughs> we have to that, um, I, I serve as creative pastor at a multi-site church. We've got 11 different locations. Hmm. And the closest thing to that is we, you'll have young adults that get into a relationship and then inevitably you got to figure out, okay, does this, do you want to end up at this campus where he's serving or do you want to go to this campus where she's serving? And mm. it's sad because you have communities that each one is established at their respective place. And so you kind of have to go, okay, uh, it's okay. <laughs> like we still love you. You just got to work out where you want to go. Cause we, I have always personally tried to push people to attend church together just because. But even then, like, because he's talking about specifically we have two people on staff at different campuses dating. So really we don't encourage them to choose a campus until they get serious into like engagement status. Yeah. Just like Isn't that, that common? Fun. fun fact. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> fun stuff. But, but Pink, we actually invited you on the show, our ecumenical series, specifically because you participated before in a form of worship through art. That's pretty unique. Um, a lot of charismatic churches might do it, probably a few others, but it's called worship painting. Could you explain to our listeners what is it and what your experience with it was like? Yeah. So pretty much uh, the most common form of worship painting, like you can do this completely on your own, just like you can worship without you know, someone to lead into worship. You can do it behind closed doors with some music. And it's just pretty much a form of worship to God via through painting. So the times I've done it has been most seen is doing the worship set of the singing at church. And I think I have painted during the message a couple times before, but it's, it's specifically during praise and worship. And I try and end the painting by then. So it's, it's very quick painting. um, Cause how long is like a worship set? Like 20, 25 minutes. So my talent has not been, you know, I'm not like Van Gogh or Picasso or anything like that. So with me specifically, I would plan what I was going to paint via the set list. And so there's some people who um, would be like, I'm just going to let the spirit lead me and I'm going to paint whatever I feel in that moment. But me personally, I would ask for the set list. I will listen to it on my own. Um, kind of like, and just get an idea of what Mm. I wanted to paint. And then I would go forward in knowing what I wanted to do during the worship set. Yeah. That man. So that actually kind of crushes some of my misconceptions, I guess. Cause I always thought that it was mostly charismatic churches because people would come up and the spirit would take over and they would just start painting was kind of the idea. But you're saying like planning ahead. It's not necessarily that. Yeah, no, it, it depends. Um, everyone's different. Me, 
personally, I maybe because I didn't feel like I had enough confidence to do it, you know, sporadically or spontaneously. But just like as someone would rehearse songs before they played them on Sunday mornings or rehearse a message before, you know, yeah. they preach it on Sunday, I enjoy doing that plus it is a very quick time so if it was a more complicated um, painting i might have sketched out like some guidelines before i started the painting as well so it's not like speaking in tongues and just like abstract art then mm -mm, no hmm. and because you just turn into a little bit of a challenge Speed kind of, it is yeah it is kind of <laughs> nerve-wracking and so it's i feel like it's the heart like that's how you turn a song into a worship song like you can sing you know god's love in a monotone voice and not really believe it or you can you know really worship the lord through the song because unless like if someone goes up there and sings a song you can tell like a little bit of their heart or if it's just for show you know what i mean and i feel like the same thing with painting like you can either go in and do it as a show or a gig to get paid or you can do it as saying this is a talent that you've given me, God, and I want to show it off for your glory. And mm -hmm. then I've had people, I've never really like sold the paintings or whatnot, but I've had people mm -hmm. who usually afterwards they offer like that spoke to me. I need this um, type deal. And I just said, give me a donation the few times that I've like sold paint, you know, just to pay for supplies and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so people would hang it um, in their house or nursery or like it would be hung somewhere else because that now they have, they had an encounter with God and now they have a like memento or like a remembrance of that encounter. That's really cool. Cool. So it's not necessarily spirit led, you know, for everybody it's different. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's like some people just like you hire like a worship leader to come lead worship. You can hire worship painters and they might do the same just like as a musician will sing their songs over and over again they may get really really good at a painting and they do that not i don't want to say skit but they do that painting over and over again i know like the really talented ones like they they paint one thing and it looks like one something but then you turn it upside down and it's something else oh that's and cool. so mm -hmm. yeah awesome so do you still like do you keep them yeah, I have quite a few um, in a closet somewhere. Um, we went to my in-laws the other day and I kept on staring at a painting. I was like, man, that looks really like that. I was like, wow, that look, that's really good. <laughs> and she was like, do you remember this? I'm like, no. I'm like, who painted this? Like, it's so good. And she's like, it was you. We found it in a church closet. I was like, oh, that's pretty funny. I was like, that is so fun. Um, and I forgot it at their house. But I mean, like, it was just one of those things. Like, it was exciting because I don't remember everything. It was so long ago. Yeah. yeah. You should I get that, though. That happens. Yeah. You should take I'll... a picture of a few and send it to us to put on a Instagram True. or something. Maybe I have to track them down. Yeah. Like, now I just mainly do abstract for funsies. That is cool. Though. Well, you do it because we don't want to pay the Hobby Lobby expensive prices. Yes. <laughs> I like so, abstract stuff though. Yeah. 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 I, uh, yeah. you know, sometimes I'll be at work and just looking at stuff and be like, man, who cut this? This looks great. And it was me. <laughs> I just forgot. Yeah. I've been there <laughs> right? for too yeah. long. Yeah. That's funny. Anyway. So is that basically the biggest misconception is just that it's always like a spirit led thing or are there other misconceptions tied with this? Um, I feel like one maybe misconception is people do it to show off type deal um, because yeah. it is kind of nerve wracking with your back. At least every yeah. time I did it, I would have my back to the people and like, you know, they're watching you and you're like, uh, don't mess like, up. Right. Don't mess yeah, up. No. Um, and the pressure of the time and whatnot. So like, like I, that's, I think one of the reasons why I did not continue it so much. And plus, I mean, like the church we're at now, like they don't really, I, I wouldn't say like don't don't understand, but they just never really had like that preference of formal worship. I'm sure they would be open to it if I felt led to ask or do it, but or whatnot. But I think I don't want to say I outgrew it, but it was just at that time in youth group, like that's yeah. what they were seeking, like and so season. I was yeah, and I was there to meet that need. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, do you think more churches should incorporate this kind of thing? Um. I, I always love it when we go to conferences or events and I see that I get really excited, but I'm an artsy person. And so I know one of the misconceptions is 
and can be very distracting, but I love watching something from nothing turn to come into life and like mm, wondering how it's wow. going to happen. And I mm. like, you know, just like you see someone dance or you see someone sing or you see someone do spoken poetry, that's someone's form of worship. And so I know I joke around when I used to just crush on Taylor when he was leading <laughs> worship. I was like, I'm getting distracted. Oh no. Um, focus. So, I mean, like you can choose your distract your distractions or whatnot. Like you can choose to stare at this and be like, what is she doing? Or you can choose to like really like sing along and experience like, wow, like look at God using this person with their talents. Yeah. I think that is a, that is a very, it is a choice. It, that's with every single thing down to the color of the pews and everything. Like the, everything can be a distraction, right? Everything that we do can be something that that removes the focus away from Jesus and goes on to that. However, I don't think that that should remove that thing from the experience. So a while ago, my mother-in-law gave me this book uh, for Christmas called Brim. I brought a prop today. Oh, nice. Wow. Uh, but it's pretty cool. Creative overflow in worship design. And it's full of the most practical um expressions of simple things that you can add to your worship experience to really drive a point home or to get everybody to think on the same path. So everything from prayers and devotional, which can be uni uh, unison prayer, guided prayers, to um, the flow of the service, how you can set up a table to bring attention to something. Uh, one of these is uh, they're, they're giving you things that you can uh, from dipping your hand in water, all, all kinds of different experiences. And, and all of those things, I think, like worship painting, can be modes to experience the Lord's love, but they can also be distractions. So I think you've got to really know your context. And if your context would benefit from worship paintings, whether that's in a you know consistent Sunday morning experience or if that is a quarterly worship night that you invite a painter to come in and do their thing, know your context, know what's going to work and bring people closer to the Lord. And if it's not going to be a distraction for your people, I think you should go for it. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's a lot like um, different people have different learning styles. And I feel like probably true of worship too, spiritual styles, like all of that. I, ironically, I always thought because I'm like super ADHD, like my pictures next to the definition of ADHD in the dictionary kind of ADHD. I always was like, yeah, that's why I'm Pentecostal because it's really high paced and like, that's my, j that's like, you know, that's my jam. Yeah. Which I still am like Pentecostal at heart, to be honest. But ever since I started attending more high liturgical church, going to like a Lutheran church, I find that like that consistent breaking it up. We have like two minute of song, stand up. We're going to do this action, sit down, 10 minute, you know, sermon, stand up, read a scripture, sit down, sing a song, you know, like just breaking it up like that has actually really helped me focus on the full church experience instead of. I get a lot out of the worship and then the first 10 minutes of the sermon. And then I don't know what happened after, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. So, uh, a more common form of worship that a lot of misconceptions kind of are formed around is worship in song. A lot of people hear the word worship and immediately just think the seeing part of church. Uh, Taylor, could you unpack some of your history with leading worship in song and address why this misconception is so popular today? I was privileged to um, sing and and play in, in what we call worship teams, which is interesting that you would say that because we have now uh, distinguished teams, right, that are just covering worship. And if you're ushering, that's not worship. It doesn't count. If you are in the in the kids area, it doesn't count. That's not worship. You have to be on the worship team. Um, but I, I, yeah, I've been... I've been able to to lead adult and kids and student worship in different seasons of my life. And I, I really do think that that is the common misconception that people do associate worship with singing. And I only worship when I'm in that room with you and the smoke is there, the lights are down, the speakers are going, the full band is having their moment. And then when the, when the word is happening, that's not worship. And when when people are passing offering buckets or bags, that's not worship. Or when people are cradling uh, babies that are crying in the, in the nursery, that's not worship. Worship is when I'm having my 15 minutes to 25 minute experience with all that stuff I mentioned earlier. And I, that is something that the older I've, I've gotten, it's kind of, it's been really upsetting to see people equate worship to just singing. 
because I think it mm-hmm. removes so much of our ordinary lives that are truly forms of worship. We just don't associate it and we don't operate as if they are. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. I, um, yeah, it's interesting. I feel like even those of us who I say us, but you guys know what I mean. But those who think really deeply about these things and like intellectually, we know that worship is way more than just the singing things. I feel like a lot of us still catch ourselves when we say worship, we mean that. And we like subconsciously add to this misconception that people who maybe don't think about it as much are going to li- cling on to because, you know, leaders of the church, like people like us, use that language without thinking about it sometimes. And I think that really is harmful. And I don't have a good solution for it because a lot of times, you know, you just you use the language that everybody else is using and you're like, oh, wait, I, I didn't quite mean it like that. But, you know, I have that problem with the word church, too. Yeah. That's Sorry. true. Look like teacher can say something. Okay. <laughs> so another thing I find interesting, a lot of people are have an easier time thinking of just like music in general as art than they do have thinking of worship music as art. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like it's easy for people to grasp, oh, music is a type of art. But if you talk about worship music as art, I feel like people get a little bit weird, a little bit like, eh, about that. Um, why, why do you think that is, Taylor? I'm not sure why I think it is. I do think it is unfortunate um, because just like there are thousands, we keep harping on Van Gogh, but just like there are probably thousands of canvases that we are not privileged to see that Van Gogh worked on in his upbringing. I think there are hours of practice times that musicians on, on church uh, singing teams, uh, not worship teams necessarily, though they are encompassing. Um, but there are hours of unseen moments where they have practiced their fingers down to calluses. Um, that is just as important as that with Van Gogh. And I, I think that it, it is all worship and it is all an art. Um, I'm not sure why. I'm gonna, I have my own hypothesis to this that uh, sure. is maybe a little mean. So I might need you to fit, correct me and well, let's rebuke see. me. <laughs> Part of it, me wonders if it's because of how modern worship music is written, like from like a music standpoint, because a lot of it's very repetitive and a lot of like, we're going to say this and it's like very formulaic yeah. as opposed to like old hymns. I have a very easy time seeing some of those other hymns. It's like, yeah, that was a work of art. You know, Amazing Grace, phenomenal. You know, but then I hear the the next song. I don't want to pick any particular bands because I don't want to be mean to anybody because I love a lot of these worship songs that sometimes are repetitive, but you know what I mean? Like it's easier to think some of these hymns as good, art good than father. Is the <laughs> yeah. He said, I'm going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> TJ has no problem. <laughs> but d- do you think I'm onto something or am I just being mean? <laughs> no, I, I don't think that you're wrong. Um, I think that in the same way, if you, and not to make an unfair comparison, um, but if you listen to top 40 radio stations, it, pop music is the four on the floor, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's driving, it's repetitive. And I think that modern worship music has followed suit in that, uh, for right or for wrong. That's just kind of where we are. Um, at least in the terms of, of many of the set lists that I'm able to see our church, uh, do, uh, and in a way I think it's meeting people where they are, but I, I think you're right. It, it has lost, now, I'll, I'll say this before I say anything else. I share a wall right here to my right with our worship pastor who is responsible for uh, pouring into 11 different worship leaders across the state of South Carolina and and really re- resourcing them and making sure they have everything they need, they need to make Sunday mornings um, effective from their, their standpoint. And I, we are releasing a, a single at the end of this month called Worthy, uh, Worthy to be Praised. Really excited about that. Um, but I got to see the months of preparation that went into writing that song. Not the preparation, mm-hmm. the, the months of writing that song. And so, yes, the modern contemporary worship songs can be, um, can be uh, criticized for being repetitive. Um, I'd say not all are, but many are. Mm-hmm. And because of that, that it gives it a bad rap because man, you look at some hymns and you're going, that's six verses of <laughs> thick yeah. boy lyrics. Like, I mean, this is yeah. dense material, right? So 
I think that by that comparison, it is a bit unfair because it always makes it seem like modern stuff is shallow. And I, I wouldn't contend that it is. I think it's just, I don't think it sets out to be the same thing. I think it yeah. worship music today, modern, contemporary, whatever, sets out to be very grabbable. And mm-hmm. I think it succeeds in that. Yeah, I yeah. think you made a really good point with that pop comparison, though, because like I'm even thinking like a lot of modern music I don't think of as art in general. But when you get to like the more indie stuff, sometimes you'll get to stuff like uh, Noah Khan, Passenger. I'm like, OK, no, that's art. Oh, yeah, that counts. And, and maybe the same thing is true on the Christian side. You know, even um, I don't agree with their current theology, but, you know, Gungor stuff. Some of that I'm like, OK, that's that's art. I um, need to breathe. Either. You know, a lot of people don't even know what's Christian. But I'm like, no, that stuff is actually really good. So, uh, you know, maybe it's just I don't like what most people like. <laughs> can <laughs> maybe I, that's really can I push is. you a little bit with that? Oh, yeah, I think it's like when you're driving down the interstate and you see the PETA billboards and they're like, where do you draw the line? And it starts as like the chicken, then you get to the pig, and then you get to the dog, and then you get to the whatever. <laughs> and it like it goes yeah. to like whatever. I think sometimes we can go, OK, the more electronic that it is or sounds, the more it's not art because it's computerized. It's not authentic. It's not God. But the crazy thing is there's a guy named Matt Glendinning that's on our staff and I've seen him produce that song I was talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. And man, you, you cannot look at me and tell me that when he adjusts the low pass filter and all of the wave forms and all of the compression settings and mm-hmm. all those things that he dials in, you can't tell me that he is not exper- he's not, he's not experiencing worship right there. Because yeah. he'll tell you he is. That is his form of worship. And so it, it is a little bit sad how some of that stuff, when it's very digital and almost poppy, it, it does kind of get characterized as, well, it's not as acoustic and whatever, you know. Yeah. It's yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah, I really, two things. I really love that PETA billboard because <laughs> right there is where I draw the line, like right between chicken and dog, where everybody else draws the line. <laughs> this is easy. Uh <laughs> Next question, yeah, not hard. <laughs> but uh, also I think uh, worship music, contemporary worship music becoming more like pop music actually has more to do with the same thing happening in Nashville and country music uh, than we can easily find. But I'm I'm almost positive that they're connected. Mm, yeah, yeah. It's probably about money. <laughs> but that seems like the connective <laughs> tissue there. Yeah. Yeah, well, probably. Now, a days I did um, in one of my MBA classes, I did a market like research studies or some kind of they can actually like take a song and through the beats and the high ends and the low ends, they can determine if it's going to be a top 40 song or hit the charts number one what? just through the just through the sound of it. So. I mean, with the whole Wild. money thing and whatnot, like they can now like sound engineer if this is going to work or not. And so That's I'm sad. not saying that, you know, like worship songs, I'm sure this was like for like, you know, secular yeah. music. I'm not saying worship songs is going to follow that suit. But one of the things I have problems with, with worship songs, um, not all of them, and I'm not going to say any, I feel like TJ will. a lot of, Reckless a lot love. of worship a lot of worship <laughs> songs will put us at the center of the song and like it's almost like emotional with mm-hmm. us being the center and like god come save me god do this god me 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 instead of you are worthy like to be praised mm-hmm. you like and like it puts a lot of the worship songs the emotional ones put it all about us and not about god that's so yeah. funny i was right yeah. yeah i actually i brought a um <laughs> Sorry, I just caught what TJ said. What do you I, uh, mean you were right? I, reckless love. But oh. I um, I actually brought a, a non-religious friend to a worship service with me once because we went to public university. It was part of the religious class was to a, attend a religious service to kind of examine it for what it is and like write a paper about it. And his big takeaway was, so basically religion exists to just express your emotions and get it out of your system. And I was like, ooh. Ooh, Interesting like take. <laughs> one yeah. of the one but, of my you know. sm- my smart friends is always like the smartest Christians who become so dang smart they become atheists or um like they like they educate themselves outside of believing God. I've known a couple people like this, um, and so as he was kind of you know being smart on in I don't want to say in his transition because that sounds weird, um, but like he was just saying he's like, have you ever noticed 
like worship song it's made for us to be emotional even like with the worship leader not every single time but they're like come on sing it out if someone's yelling Mm -hmm. at you to sing it went almost like coaxing you into that emotional experience instead of an encounter with god not all the time but i feel like you have to be careful just like with church camp you get a spiritual high and then it goes away yeah yeah no for sure i um yeah i mean it's it's interesting. There's this, there's art that's meant to express something that we can connect with. And at some level, the spiritual and the emotional are definitely related. But at some point, I feel like we feed so much in the emotional that we drop the other stuff. Um, on the intellectual part, this is just my quick little aside thing, because I've also noticed that um, typically in my experience, it's because people were taught a certain way of believing Christianity. And they were taught that as this is the complete dogma and any other way of thinking about it is wrong. Um, cause for me, I had a very similar experience, but really instead of me losing my faith, I realized, Hey, maybe I'm actually reading the Bible wrong. Maybe these things that I were taught about the thing were wrong and I should re-examine them before just dropping the whole thing. Um, and that's not just me trying to do some apologetic gospel stuff. That's just, you know, my experience and what I've observed from other people is a lot of times they just jump to, Oh, okay. So I can't believe, for example, Genesis one is literal. So I'm going to drop everything. Well, you know, there's a lot of parts of Christianity that don't think that's literal. There are even some people who believe in literal Bible reading and think that that one's not literal, you know, like maybe actually examine the thing and work with a little bit more before you just say one thing's wrong, everything's wrong. That's called that's a slippery great slope fallacy. Slippery slope fallacy is bad. Um, <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So is there anything you'd like to see change in how this is typically done today? Like the yeah. worship and music part of the yeah, service? Yeah, the worshipy music part. I think the mix should be adjusted so the, the bass is amplified a bit more. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, I would say I would like there to be a... I think I, Not to harp on it again, but I would like to see all parts of... Um, We call them dream teamers, but all parts of people who are serving any function on the Sunday, in the Sunday experience, I would like for them to carry that weight of worship in everything that they're doing. And I would like for people to realize that they can take worship outside of that 20, 25 minute window of a Sunday service. So for us, we're a charismatic church. So we have, you know, five minute countdown. Then we have about 25 minutes of worship. Then we go into some service hosting. Then we go into the the word um, for about 35, 40, 45 minutes. And then we go into some altar time and then we close and we go home. So I would like for people in, in our congregation to, and even in the big C across the board, um, for them to realize that they can take those moments of, moments of connection, which we a lot of times boil down to worship with singing, they can take that out of the room and they can experience God outside of that environment. Mm. Yeah. I really, I really enjoy hearing people talk about the assemblies of God uh, because, you know, we are church of God of prophecy and it's hilarious to hear like the, sp- the split assemblies of God managed to get super modern and Church of God of Prophecy allowed women to wear pants like 50 years ago. Yeah. I have so many stories of like my parents' generations during my lifetime when the Church of God of Prophecy allowed them to start wearing wedding rings. That was like such a big deal to so many people. And I didn't How realize wild. until my wedding day that I was like the first man in our family to have a wedding band. And I was like, oh, wow, this is weird. <laughs> I didn't even realize it was weird. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, so before we, we get to the end, there's a few other things we like to do. Um, firstly, Hey, where can people go find you guys on your other podcast, the Clydes? Let's, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. Um, I think we are available on all major podcast platforms. Just search the Clydes, C L Y D E. Yeah. Google podcasts have given us a little bit of a problem, but (laughs) Yeah. But yes. <laughs> I mean, I think we're pretty all right, but you know. I, I'm a fan. I listen. I mean, yeah. I'm glad to be here. I, even when you talked about money, I still listened. 
It's a good money. Is it was, it was a good episode. But even also, though I don't like thinking about money. <laughs> that's one thing we didn't talk about. I love like with our church, we say we're going to continue worship and give our tithes and offerings because that's, I feel like the whole church service really is a worship service, even like the message and whatnot. And so it just, it goes really worship should be incorporated in our like lives. It's not just on Sunday morning. Mm, yeah. And I, um, the people I knew who really understood giving as a form of worship uh, weren't limited to doing it in church either. You'd see them just at McDonald's and randomly leaving yep. a tip at McDonald's. And I'm like, yeah, these people figure it out. These people. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. So usually on our episodes, before we get to our wrap up or anything like that, we ask everybody for a, a single tangible action, but we're switching it up a little bit for our series. So instead of asking for a tangible action for unity, we're going to ask you guys outside of paintings or statues, what is one kind of art that you think people could get into that might help us all draw closer to God and one another? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make Taylor go first on this one, I think. Yeah, that sounds fair. <laughs> one form of art that I think people could get into that could help gr- uh, bring closer to bring us closer to God. And each other. Got to do both. And each other. It's a twofer. <laughs> Which is, is not a sculpting or painting. Yeah. Right, right, right. So we're going like super broad strokes. Okay. Um. Okay. I, I won't say it's art necessarily. Uh, my first inclination was to say journaling, but journaling is not necessarily art. Um, I mean, if it turns into a novel type deal, yeah, like you can you share it with other people. Writing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's fair. Poetry. Yeah. I, I think writing specifically in my context, we have a lot of good experiences and memories with small groups. And in those, in some of my favorites, we do this thing called, uh, soap journaling, which is an acronym. Soap is a uh, scripture observation application prayer. So you'd pick a passage or a chapter that everybody would read in the group. And then you would independently journal. You'd write down one scripture in that passage that stood out to you. You'd write down observations that you see, who's in it, who wrote it, what's happening. Then you'd write down one application that you can apply from that verse. And then you'd write down a prayer. And then we would always be those evil group leaders that would encourage people <laughs> uh, heavily to share what they've written. Um, even down to the prayer sometimes, because I, I like when people share their written prayers because nobody teaches how to pray, you know? They just kind of go, okay, pray. And we we don't really teach how to do that very well. So I think that writing and then sharing what you've written from your quiet time with the Lord could be pretty powerful. Yeah. I've read some written prayers that I think it'd be really hard to say wasn't art. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say pangs before she says it? (gasps) No. It's not. You're not going to say what I thought. Oh, you you changed it? No, I haven't changed it. Oh, is it cooking? No. Okay. Ooh. (laughs) Baking? That was no. mine last okay. time, was, was culinary arts. <laughs> so, Elizabeth, what is it? Okay, uh, mine, which is, uh, I don't do this, but we have a group at church who does this, knitting. And they have knit blankets for, like, a local orphanage around, hand, um, around here, or they, like, knit little plushies to take to the MUSE, um, like, the, the NICU uh, for, like, premature babies. And so they use knitting as a form, I believe, of worship and to really impact others. That's cool. Man, I gotta say, I would have never thought of that answer. That was, I know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's pretty good. That's really cool. That's Thank solid. You. Yeah. I'm Me gonna personally, say cooking. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I said it last time. You can't. <laughs> Why not? Uh, so, uh, what do you, what would be the repercussions in the world around us if everyone stopped and took the time to appreciate either knitting or journaling and putting that into practice? I feel like all those things that you just said, it requires people to slow down and to be mindful. You don't just like boom, cook out a meal. You don't boom and you have a prayer journal. You don't just boom and a scarf is knitted. You have to take the time to stop and be intentional with each of those. Yeah. Yeah, that's super good. I think for me, we talked about it. um, Actually, I think it was in our last episode uh, we talked about vulnerability and, and transparency um, and yeah, intimacy good, specifically. Great um, thank you. But I think it, regarding the writing, from my perspective, if we shared it with each other, that would introduce so much vulnerability. And I think that would be a beautiful thing. I think we could all agree that we need some, we need some more openness with each other. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah. I told you guys, careful. We're going to start speaking in tongues again. <laughs> Starting all over. So before we wrap up, uh, we always like to do our God moment segment, which uh, if you haven't listened, which would be pretty rude. Uh, but if you're new here, that's where we just talk about a moment where we saw God recently, whether that be a blessing, challenge, moment of worship, what have you. I always make Josh go first, so the rest of us get plenty of time to think. Uh, so, Josh, do you have a God moment for us this week? As always, I have plenty, especially because we didn't record last week, and that's just so weird for us. Um, I'm, I'm going to go with with a financial one. A financial one. I was um, looking to work a little bit closer. I saw that a Chipotle was opening near here, and I was like, I wonder if I still have any relations or if they all hate me and will never take me back. And not only did Chipotle say, hey, we want you back. They were like, we want you back. We're going to pay you more than you're making now. And we have big plans for what we think you could do with the company. So get back here ASAP. And my hours, they said for the next few weeks are, hey, when do you feel like coming in? It won't count against any store. So you have all the overtime you want. And I'm like, sick, bet. So I'll be working pretty hard this weekend, but it'll actually help because I was uh, in need of help, which is part two of my blessing where I was in need of help, and a, a good friend of mine, um, TJ, was able to, to bless me. So I'm, I'm thankful for TJ. So I'm thankful and blessed and uh, challenged because I'm going to be working with people again. I need to remember to show God's love daily to coworkers and customers. Yeah. One of life's greatest challenges. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> so uh, I will go next to give our actual guests enough time to think, but I feel like they're full of them anyway. So I feel like I should get to go last, but, uh, I talked my way out of remembering. Okay. I got it. So one of my best friends just had a baby, which is crazy. You know, like the first person in the friend group to have a child. Uh, it's great. We all love her. Uh, her name's Charlotte. Uh, and it's just really, really cool to, you know, sort of be at a, I am an uncle. It's this is different. This is a different type of uncle. Yeah. No Friend obligations, uncle. uncle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's super cool. And they have recently accepted a position at a church and they're being so supporting. And it's great to see God work so hard for this family. It's, it's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Taylor, do you have a God moment for us? I don't want to steal Liz's, but I, I feel like I might steal a part of hers at least. You can go for it. Um, mine's sort of specific with that, though. So we had um, a rather difficult uh, situation in our immediate family um, that kind of shook down this past week and told several close friends about it. And in my inbox this morning was a $10, 10 or $15. I don't remember how much it, it was. It was 10 a $10 Starbucks gift card that, and I quote, because I feel like the, the listeners need to know exactly what it said. It yeah. said, a basic drink for a not so basic. Hope you get to enjoy a fall Bev soon. It's Bev is <laughs> beverage. Uh, my prayers are with you, friend. Um, and it was just an anonymous Perfect. thing that somebody had just given me a $10 Starbucks gift card. And to me, I'm an act of service person in addition to a words of affirmation. That's kind of like my biggest mm -hmm. love languages, I think. Um, and so for them to go out of their way to send that really, really kind of spoke volumes to me. So it was, to me, I saw that that God, it's that unity that God brings and that compassion that he brings and puts inside of people. And when they act on that, it's like, man, I've read stories about Jesus being moved with compassion and doing stuff. And in, in this simple act of giving me a $10 Starbucks gift card, you were moved with compassion like Jesus. So it just, it was a cool kind of interaction. Is it ever weird to think of like people gifting something to you could be their worship to God also? See? Because it's like, they're not worshiping you, but like they are in worship while doing a thing for you. I'm just saying. Nuance. It's weird. <laughs> yeah, it's good stuff though. All right, Peng. God So. This is going to sound very pessimistic, but this is just this is just where I'm at. Honestly, like okay. this week has been the worst week of my life, and I don't say that lightly, and it's hard for me to see God this week. But my friends have surrounded me and they showed me God's love when I can't see God hmm. and his goodness this week. So that would be um 
how I say it because I'm in a dark place right now personally, but my friends are loving me well. That's good. Mm. Also, incredible how well put together you are because I would have never guessed you were in a dark place. I, yeah. you kind of, you have to, it's all, it's all about mental health. I block it and then I let myself feel later, but then, you know, you block it again to get She said, the day. don't poke me too hard. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, yeah. the, that's the most Christian as in Ashley thing I think I've ever heard you say. I might be the Speaking most similar Christian. you and Christian Ashley might ever be is that sentence. That's funny. If you want to understand that joke, check out Systematic Geekology, wherever podcasts are found. Uh, but if you like this show, please consider sharing with a friend, an enemy, uh, share with a cousin. We love our cousins. Uh, you can also uh, get merch on the store to support the show. Uh, we love to see people rocking the merch. Most of the time, it's just Josh, I think. Uh, it's comfy. Yeah, it is comfy, allegedly. I mean, you felt the all shirt. of all of my merch is magnets. Yeah, and cup. although you the shirt you felt was technically for systematic ecology, but it's the same shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just comfy stuff. And speaking of systematic ecology in the Clydes, if you want to check out some of the other shows. In the Amazon Ministries Podcast Network, the AMP Network, if you will. The website for that is in the show notes. We have all kinds of other pods over there. I do another one, Dummy for Theology. TJ's about to start one. Hockey in the Carolinas or Hockey Night in the Carolinas. I don't know. It's Hockey Night in Carolina. Yeah. There is there is the homily with Pastor Chill Will from Chapel Hill. There is Christian Ashley's Let Nothing Move You. Um, I already said Dummy for Theology. There's the Bible After Hours if you want something a little bit uh, more on the progressive, a little bit uh, edgier side, I guess, maybe. But it's good stuff. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed it. Come back next week. We'll be continuing our ecumenical aesthetic series with Dr. Nathan Gilmore discussing iconography and the dangers of idol worship. After that, we'll be joined by Pastor Will Rose and Reverend Kino Kennedy to discuss our favorite pieces of art from other Christian traditions. And then Dr. Link and Dr. Peter Beck will... Oh, they're both Peter. I got confused. I thought they were both Link. They're both Peter. That's why I skipped one of their first names. Doctors Peter, Link, and Beck will be on with us to discuss how imagery is used in the Bible and the symbolism in some of our church flags. And finally, at the end of season one, Francis Chan will be joining us. Yeah, he doesn't know that. So someone He's let him know. Blissfully unaware. I assume he has a statue over there somewhere near the uh, Stephen Furtick one, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just behind it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it took significantly less marble. <laughs>